panel starts in five minutes. The panel starts in five minutes.
everyone. I hope you enjoyed your coffee break and welcome back. So this is our third panel. Uh, this is a Black Sea region at the boiling point and it will touch on Moldova, Romania, Turkey, Bulgaria and the challenges that the entire region is facing. So I'd like to very quickly introduce our panel, Alexandru Flinka, Doro Kostia, Simono Kojokaru, uh, Vasida Chernova, Thomas Mayer Harting and the moderator Oana Popescu. I'm fear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. A pleasure to be hosting this discussion, especially since I'm standing between you and lunch. Um, I wish I didn't have to do it under these circumstances, though. But without wasting any more of your time, um, let us get straight to the point. And, and the point is, and I would start with you, uh, Mrs. Simona Kojokado. You are um, State Secretary in the Romanian Ministry of Defense. Romania has, has been calling for more attention to the Black Sea region, to the southern eastern flank of NATO, if I can say so, for a long time now, precisely for circumstances such as these that I, we are living these days. And my two questions to you would be, are you satisfied with the NATO response so far? Do, are we where we should have been perhaps years back? Or are we at least on the right path? And then secondly, what can we do, the literal states, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, NATO members, as well as non-NATO members? Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be in Belgrade, attending the Belgrade Security Conference for the first time. What a great audience here. I salute the distinguished panelists. And I would like to start by saying that the old assumptions on peace are not as certain as they are a couple of years ago. Romania was amongst the strongest advocates of increasing uh, NATO's European Union positions on uh, the regional level on the Black Sea region, and I would like to say also that history seemed unchallengeable at some point, but now the era of innocence, I think it's over in Russian with Russian Federation. So, yes, we are satisfied. We had uh, the important decisions, the big bang decisions, if you like, in NATO summit in Madrid last June, and now the presence on the eastern flank uh, at the Black Sea, I have seen some images from MK or Mikhail Kogalnichanu Air Base in Romania. We are talking now about a multi-dimensional, multinational support, and you have seen all the speed, scale, and scope of uh, the Allied and also the bilateral level deployments in Romania in the aftermath of 24 of February. For the first time in modern history of the Alliance, NATO deployed the Sparehead Force very, very quickly in three days on the shore of the Black Sea starting with the end of February. You have also seen such an important signs of solidarity and unity at the NATO and EU level in relation with what is happening with the war of aggression in, in Ukraine. Yes, we are on the right path. We have witnessed important decisions at the Allied and also at the EU level, uh, unprecedented, and we are very much continuing to implement. And these are not big words, ladies and gentlemen. This is about doing our homework as allies and with literal states, as you mentioned. We How are we doing our homework? Uh, we are putting <clears throat> a lot of effort in More developing... More concretely. What, what uh, kind of effort? Money. For instance, Romania is one of the countries that is increasing the defense budget to 2.5% of GDP starting with 2023. Some would say that that comes out of a relatively small budget. So is that enough? Can we, can we actually make if a significant contribution? If you are asking me, working in the defense policy, I would say it is not enough. I mean, it's absolutely clear. But 2.5% makes Romania one of the successful stories within the alliance. Uh, yesterday, our prime minister was in Brussels meeting with uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, with President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and we, they talked about the Black Sea and about Romania's commitment to be nowadays a mature, a committed ally to the security of the alliance, to the security of Europe and Euro-Atlantic uh, as a whole. So we are doing a lot, 
we are investing, we, uh, you know, that after Crimea 2014, Romania set up on national territory like other countries on the eastern flank, command and control structure, multinational brigade, multinational division, HQ, multinational corps. Now we are setting up with France at the lead nation a battle group alongside with the new four ones decided by our leaders uh, earlier this year in Romania, Hungary, Slovakia and Bulgaria adding, complementing the existing four ones in Baltic states and Poland. So, we are translating to what we are calling a unitary forward defense on the eastern flank, and we are investing a lot in our air bases, in our capabilities, together with our strategic partners and NATO allies. Thank you very much. Vesela, I, I will turn to you to, to complement um, what's just been said, because you, you have worked both for government recently, and then you also have the kind of the critical look from uh, the think tank perspective. Um, unlike Poland and the Baltics, which have invested significantly and, and do have their own capacity, very often the answer that I get from the Romanian side when asked, how are we boosting our capacities, on the southern flank, the, the answer is we're getting more NATO troops, we're getting more allied troops, more allied equipment. Does that mean that we as a region are not doing enough, the literal states, and can we do more? If you allow me, I will start by saying that the region is actually, to me, a very hard one to describe, or even a non-existent. I am not convinced that the title of this session is actually true, that there is a Black Sea region. Uh, it has to do with the complexity of, of uh, the countries around the Black Sea, um, but this is not the Baltics, right? I mean, we have to be quite clear about that, and we can delve into the reasons why this is so, but the fact is that there are disparities in the um, uh, military capabilities of the countries around. Uh, there, is, there are disparities in their risk assessments. There are totally different worldviews if you take uh, other parts of the, the non-NATO parts of the Black Sea. Uh, so, you know, talking about the Black Sea region uh, as such, I think, is a big challenge. Having said that, I think there, is clearly, there are clearly things that uh, the literal countries can do. Uh, obviously, uh, spending more on defense, but I think most of all, uh, working together. And I would say that uh, this coalition on the eastern flank is something that we should probably keep up uh, and develop uh, more than before. Joint air policing, uh, maritime uh, surveillance, sharing intelligence on that, and, uh, but also uh, why not uh, common maritime uh, guards and so on. Um, I would say security, however, is when you talk about the Black Sea or parts of the Black Sea, um, security does not necessarily only have to do with hard power. It has to do clearly with the humanitarian aspect of this crisis. Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova have received a massive, uh, massive wave of refugees. It is not impossible that we see um, actually a, a, an even bigger one coming uh, onto us as, uh, uh, as we go forward. And while the humanitarian aspect is very, is very important, I think there is also a security aspect to this. But can I, can I just ask you, uh, because you, you always speak about these countries together, um, what are the perspectives for actual coordination and cooperation? Are we able to cooperate? Because I still remember um, the Romanian initiative of a Black Sea flotilla a few years mm -hmm. back, which uh, fell through, um, unfortunately, because of opposition from Bulgaria and Turkey. What stops us from cooperating, and can we hope this is going to improve? Um, I am not going to go into the flotilla question because it will be a separate sure, big it's just discussion. An example. But I think what can bring us together are clearly common threats. So nothing brings us together <laughs> in this region, region better than threats. Uh, but, uh, but one thing that could also keep us together is common strategic infrastructure. And we saw with the energy crisis, but now also with the military threat, that we don't have enough critical infrastructure together, that we cannot 
we, we don't have that many choices if the Black Sea for some reason stop being, uh, stops being you know, accessible uh, from the Mediterranean, what do we do uh, with our uh, critical uh, resources? So we need to have a much better, I think, south-north uh, 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 infrastructure, both in terms of energy resources, but also in terms of military mobility and so on. Um, and I think most of all, uh, we will have to work on this uh, probably uh, politically within the EU context. And if you allow me uh, uh, to mention the EU here for the first time in this panel, um, I think the EU unity and in general having the countries from the so-called eastern flank get their act together in terms of their political stamina, stability, but also their... Uh, you know, willingness to take initiative within the EU, also in its uh, defense bit, are probably going to take us further than we are currently. Thank you very much. Um, and I will, I, I will get back to the um, EU a little bit later, but I'm moving uh, back to NATO um, for, for a bit. Um, to focus um, a, a little on Turkey, and Ambassador Costa, um, you have good knowledge of the Middle East in general and the Near um, Eastern region. Turkey has become a player that's harder and harder to understand sometimes. Um, how do you assess the role of Turkey? Because eventually, when it comes strictly to the Black Sea, it is Turkey that has been able to broker the grain deal that allows Ukraine uh, to export its, its um, agricultural produce it is Turkey that's trying to broker negotiations. It is Turkey that we all look to as the actual opponent, maritime opponent of Russia um, around the Black Sea. So my question is, what is Turkey in this? Is it a predictable NATO ally? Is it a lone rider playing its own game and we need to learn how to deal with it? What can we expect? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I wish you could have uh, found a more complex one. This is so simple. <laughs> um, the, Turkey's role uh, in, the, in this whole file is at least as complex as um, the very issue of the Black Sea region, mm. as was just mentioned by uh, our colleague. Is there a Black Sea region or not? Uh, is there a Turkey that is an ally, reliable in NATO, or what it is? So you put them together. It is not an artificial thinking, I'm, I'm afraid. It is just triggered by the reality. Oh, sorry, by realities, uh, plural. One reality is that this region, let's agree for a moment that we are talking about a region, used to be, as somebody said some almost 20 years ago, the Bermuda Triangle of the Western think strategic thinking. Because the region borders strategic regions and belongs to none. It falls, you know, among them. So, somehow it manages to manage to elude any definition. However, Mr. Putin, among very many unintended consequences uh, of his actions, now he's facing another one, an area which gains personality, because it is there. It is in NATO concept, as Secretary of State said, and it is in the naval concept of Russia, as we know in the document that was published one month uh, after the Madrid um, NATO document. Where comes Turkey here? Well, if, if you look at the whole history, it is um, actually Turkey who had at one moment for about 200 years uh, turned the, la the, this, the sea into a Turkish lake. Then all of a sudden it was turned to a, a sort of a condominium some say, and now there are people who think that this is where we are going. 
because it's Turkey and Russia, Turkey and Russia. No, uh, why? Turkey has the key to, to the Montreux uh, Convention. But Turkey has also, uh, we need to understand why Ch Turkey is doing what uh, it's doing. We need to take a small step behind and look at the becoming of new Turkey, what happened to, to it. And very, very briefly, I'm just sketching out things. One is that um, everybody knows the, the, the follow, fallout of First World War and what happened to the Ottoman Empire. Well, it disappeared, but it did not disappear from the mentality. It did not disappear from the memory of, of, the, uh, of the people in the, in the area, neither in Turkey proper nor around Turkey. You mentioned Middle East. One of the um, scares of the, uh, of the uh, Levant is Turkey coming back. It used to be there, and now it's coming back. Look at Syria, and there you are. Uh, another very sketchy thing. The Turkish sources and our partners in the uh, uh, New Strategy Center tell us, focus on compartmentalization of foreign policy. Slicing. This is economy, energy with Russia. This is a contradiction with Russia in Syria, and so on and so forth. So this allows them to promote a very flexible and sometimes creative uh, uh, political action. Are they doing the same with respect to NATO? So they're not necessarily internalizing every rule and value as, as the others do, but give their own interpretation? Uh, the short answer is no. The longer answer is no but, because they are not doing it bluntly, and they are actually uh, very um, creatively sometimes, and sometimes annoyingly, promoting their own interests in front of any other ones. The last example is the Swedish, the Swedish and Finnish uh, accession, and we know two days ago what happened. Um, the, the point is that one, uh, uh, one uh, uh, prominent uh, Turkey, uh, Turkish uh, analyst said uh, the, about that, that this is because um, they want something. They are ready to bargain. So they are aiming at getting something in return. It is not un, uh, unseen. This is the essence of diplomacy, to bargain, to gain something in return. The point is that Turkey has a card it thinks, and particularly President Erdogan, thinks it, he may play and win. And can I, can I just uh, um, kind of bring this first round of, of uh, questions to you to, to an, an end um, by asking you if you were to oversimplify and just give a yes or no answer to the question, we are going to need Turkey for energy diversification, for maritime trade routes, um, for dealing with Russia more widely. Will we be able to count on Turkey or should we see Turkey as more of an obstacle? Uh, we must take, you, we must put Turkey in our equations, no matter what we want to do with the area. Otherwise, or to put it otherwise, you ca we cannot ignore Turkey at our own peril. And we cannot take it for granted. And we need to better understand what it wants. And Turkey needs to better understand what we want of, of Turkey, because I've, I'm afraid, and I'm very, uh, this is my, my very personal view, that sometimes we don't know what, what we expect from mm -hmm. Turkey. Thank you very much. Um, I will move outside of the NATO um, framework now to Moldova um, and, and ask um, Alexander Flenka how you see the, it's, you know, so far it's the perspective from within NATO, so from the relative comfort and safety of the NATO security umbrella. Um, how has the war affected Moldova and, and what do you see in the short and medium run even, not necessarily in the long run, um, how do you see the options for Moldova to increase its security, both in a very hard 
security um, kind of way, meaning your country has neutrality in its constitution, is this something that's going to be rediscussed, renegotiated, but also in terms of energy um, dependence on Russia? Do, and are there solutions beyond this winter? Oh, there is actually two very complex question, uh, questions that I could uh, keep talking on for hours and hours and hours. I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, yes, indeed, Moldova is a neutral country that's enshrined in our constitution. Uh, however, unless this war totally escalates and uh, changes the world irreversibly, what we are going to have after the war uh, will be a new um, uh, security architecture in Europe. And part of that new security architecture will be some security arrangements for uh, the Black Sea region, at least for the um, north, north and northwestern part of the Black Sea. And that would have to include not only, not only Ukraine, and, but also Moldova. And if, for some reason, such uh, uh, separate security arrangements for Ukraine and Moldova uh, are not created, then Moldova must, and it's not a should or could, it's a must, initiate discussions, consultations with partners, and create security arrangements for itself, and uh, in a broader geographical sense, for Ukraine. Because even right now, but also more so after the war, uh, Moldova will be in between uh, Ukraine, which is just like Moldova, you can't it, but also, also, has a stated goal of joining NATO. And then uh, west of Moldova, our immediate neighbor Romania, also EU and NATO member state. And, well, Moldova will have to, and it must already now, initiate consultations and discussions uh, to create a vision of, of security uh, uh, agreements and security arrangements for itself, for its own future. And we have two countries, one current NATO member and one future NATO, NATO member state. So whether or not that will be compatible with, uh, with, with neutrality, uh, time will show, but neutrality, just like NATO, is not an end in itself, right? It's one of the possible options to ensure security. And Has that discussion know... started in Chisinau? Is this something that's, uh, that's this... being acknowledged and discussed? And, and, and are there proposals on the table, or is this a process that's just starting? There is something that will have to be started. I think uh, people and politicians are uh, only in the reflection phase, also uh, pretty much is uh, being affected by, by the war and the war thinking mm -hmm. and concerns uh, about the, the possible mm -hmm. spillover effect. So I have to admit politicians, decision makers are more focused on immediate future goals and immediate future uh, objectives as opposed to longer term perspective, which I think so far it's only the civil society that is trying to look more in the longer term. And probably one of the pressing issues that um, everybody's focused on is energy, because um, essentially for Moldova right now, energy availability and its cost are the determining factors for how this winter is going to mm. be, uh, uh, how you're going to go through the winter. Um, is there any discussion on how Moldova is likely to increase its energy independence from Russia? Well, uh, if anyone is asking themselves how does uh, uh, weaponization of energy by Russia work, Moldova is a great example to illustrate that. Uh, it happens so that about 90% of our uh, electricity generation is located in Transnistria and effectively owned by Russia. And also it happens that all of, I, I stress that, all of Moldova's energy sector is based on natural gas, whether it's Gazprom or other sources, but it's natural gas and it's been Gazprom so far. And just to illustrate to you, uh, natural gas bills the tariffs. In the past 12 months, from October last year to October this year, have increased by 500%. You heard it right, by six times. And we're talking about the poorest nation in Europe. And the reason I'm talking about poverty is that poverty is best allied to uh, manipulation and political corruption. So Russia does not necessarily need to roll tanks into Moldova to have Moldova under control. No. 
it can instrumentalize and use poverty and use uh, energy weaponization to have Moldova uh, destabilized. Because you know, the, the so-called pro-Russian parties in Moldova don't really have broad support. They only have support of the poor people who are easy to manipulate and corrupt. How do we fix that? Integration, integration, integration. And I'm not talking about political and economic only because that's underway. I'm talking about infrastructure and interconnections. I think this year and this war has shown to us that energy resources, resources in general, are not necessarily in short supply. There is no necessarily deficit of resources. What we're lacking is uh, transport infrastructure. There's gas available, but there's no infrastructure available to supply it in the needed quantities where it's needed most, Moldova in this case. So uh, this is what has to be addressed right now, uh, medium-term future and longer-term future. And one last point here. Transnistria, because I, I said this is where the, uh, most of, of the energy infrastructure is located. Transnistria, uh, Russia's influence and the leverages in Transnistria have two pillars. is the Russian troops in Transnistria and the free Russian gas. And you take away one of these two elements and the whole con construct collapse. And keep that in mind, keep that in mind. Uh, it also happens that Transnistria's uh, uh, electricity, oh, energy infrastructure is not separate from the rest of the world. It's fully integrated into Moldova's and Ukraine's energy infrastructure. So if the supplier were to be replaced, guess what happens and what consequences would that have politically and security-wise on Transnistria and Moldova as a whole? Well, and the Black Sea region in the broader sense. Exactly. Um, and, and let me uh, use that to transition precisely to um, frozen conflicts in the, in the Black Sea region, Transnistria included. Um, what we have now for sure is the breakdown of the 5 plus 2 negotiation format. Um, I don't know if at this point there is, any, uh, there is anything that we can replace it with. And so I will ask you, uh, Mr. Meyer Harding, you have been dealing with this. Um, everybody at this point, I believe, agrees um, the OSCE itself is not necessarily in a position to play much of a role um, under these circumstances. The 5 plus 2 format is very unlikely to be revived. So on the spectrum between we have a crisis, as long as we deal with the crisis collectively with the Russian war on Ukraine, that is where we will stop because we don't want to think in the longer term. And then at the other end of the spectrum, this could actually provide the opportunity to overhaul the entire security architecture around the Black Sea and even solve existing frozen conflicts. Where do you think we are at this point? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm obviously, what I'm saying is in my personal capacity, but I will, if I may, start at the most regional end uh, of your question, which is basically to say also, with a view to the title, that whatever the problems are and how concerning the situation might be, Transnistria right now is not at a boiling point. And that, I think, is due to two factors. The first, of course, the incredible resilience of the Ukrainian armed forces, because had uh, the Russian forces reached Odessa, as some Russian military leaders announced as a war goal, then of course the situation would be dramatically different. Odessa is only 70 kilometers from the, uh, from the Moldovan borders. You can, a refugee can practically walk there. So, I mean, that situation would have been uh, fundamentally different. But the other factor, and this is perhaps nonetheless an element to be added to what you said, is that the sides in this uh, Transnistrian context, that is to say, the authorities in Chisinau and the de facto authorities in Tiraspol, have established and are continuing uh, to maintain a dialogue on all sorts of number of issues. And precisely uh, for the reasons that Mr. Flenker just mentioned, the Transnistrian local elites are affected by some of the phenomenon exactly in the same way as Moldovan society. And they have certain shared interests which are not identical with broader Russian interests. And so you have this dialogue which has been ongoing, which focuses, amongst other things, on energy. And this dialogue is OSC facilitated. So, in fact, uh, as a sort of sl a slight uh, rectification of what you said, the OSC is, in fact, playing a relatively useful role right now in keeping the situation there more stable uh, than it would otherwise be. 
Now, when you come to the 5 plus 2 format, uh, which you mentioned, I mean, this, of course, uh, in the overall context of European security arrangements, and more specifically, even in the context of the OSCE, has been something rather unique in the past. As you know, it's the only uh, format in which there was some sort of interaction, uh, moderately constructive, but even so, even with the Russian Federation. I mean, the Russian Federation has maintained de facto the status quo in Transnistria, but you have had this process, uh, this very unusual process, where there were three mediators, the OSC, Russia, Ukraine, and two observers, uh, the European Union and the United States. Now, obviously, you're right to say that under the given circumstances, a process where uh, Russia which is uh, leading a war of aggression against Ukraine, sits together with Ukraine in a, in a, in a mediation process as co-mediators is out of the question. So this process right now is frozen. And that is, in fact, the term that everybody is using. I was in Kiev recently, and even the Ukrainian side says the process is frozen. Nobody knows for certain what will happen afterwards. And it may well be, uh, even under these new security arrangements that Mr. Flenke has mentioned, that you need some kind of structure which allows for some uh, uh, interaction between those participants who've been part of the 5 plus 2 process uh, until now. Kiev I mean, is also saying that Transnistria might be part of the um, eventual Ukraine-Russia negotiations. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think essentially uh, what, what, what counts is what the Republic of Moldova itself uh, sees as the goals for its future. And as you know, uh, we are operating on the basis of, at least that was what even all OSC uh, contracting parties, including uh, participating states, including at the time even Russia agreed to, sovereignty, territorial integrity within uh, the Republic of Moldova's internationally recognized borders with a special status uh, for Transnistria. But what I wanted to say is there are two uh, uh, factors which are certainly important uh, right now in this uh, new constellation uh, that we are seeing. The one, of course, is that the sort of logic of empire, the logic of spheres of influence, I think, must clearly be overcome if we want to have a durable uh, a European security architecture. And the other, of course, is that the Republic of Moldova has made a choice uh, for membership uh, in the European Union. I mean, I dealt with this file before I worked for the OEC chair in office within the structures of the European Union. And the European Union, in a quite dramatic decision has accepted this choice in the sense that they're now uh, negotiating uh, with the Republic of Moldova or will negotiate uh, on membership. And if you sort of accept these new parameters that the Republic of Moldova, and that of course includes Transnistria because we recognize the Republic of Moldova in its internationally recognized borders, is moving towards membership in the European Union, and then you find a new sort of security structure which is no longer based on logics of spheres of influence and the like, then we will still need probably some sort of a format of interaction, which may, as I said, also include all those who were in the 5 plus 2 process, but mm -hmm. under a very different uh, geometry, under a very different international philosophy than what we've seen so far. Well, uh, let me be a little bit provocative and, and Vesela, turn to you and, and argue that one of the fundamental factors that's actually um, uh, driven the Transnistrian separatist regime to cooperate with Kishino rather than um, side with Russia in this conflict, is that the EU has included Transnistria in the DCFTA, the um, free trade agreement um, signed with Moldova, and right now the leadership in Tiraspol is more interested in continuing their corrupt dealings, which benefit somehow from, this, uh, uh, from, from trade with the EU, rather than be dragged into a war. So one of the things that we have in common in this region, which might qualify us to be a region, is higher levels of corruption than in other uh, parts of Europe. Is it likely that on the softer side, not on the hard security side, we are going to be dealing with increased attempts by Russia to destabilize this region through these uh, means, or do you think that Russia is going to be too weak uh, to have any time and energy left for that? Clearly, corruption has been one of the big channels for Russian influence in our part of Europe. Uh, and we have seen this. Uh, we have also seen um, 
that when severing the energy links with Russia, there was a lot of also domestic outcry and uh, political parties who have been, uh, in a way, uh, closer to Russia have also had a specific stance on Gazprom and so on. So all of that you can trace quite, quite well and quite clearly. Um, but because we're also in the Balkans, um, we have been saying here in the Balkans that it is not Nokia, but corruption that's connecting people. Uh, I think corruption can also work in that way as you, um, uh, as you describe, that it's actually much more lucrative to stay within a certain trade realm rather than being, being dragged into a war. And I think this has helped also here in the Balkans on many occasions. Um, but speaking about Russian influence, I think what we should really keep in mind when we talk about this, the common security threats and, uh, and this, our strategies in how to react to them, uh, I think this should be really our um, paying attention to, to, the, to the quality of the democracies in our countries and how resilient we are in general. And here comes, of course, the language of rule of law. I know that for the military experts, it's not that much of a common topic, but I think, frankly, uh, the density of our institutions, how well are they equipped to cope with, with stress, with shocks from the outside, has a lot to do with our judicial systems, with our, uh, uh, with our resilience, with our media. Uh, and, uh, and I think there is, uh, on, on the one hand, a bit of an awakening, I, I hope at least, in our publics as well uh, for that fact. But I think also our allies further west have realized how important that is to really pay attention to media, to resilience in general, to the ability of our countries and societies to really uh, resist uh, malign influence. And Simona Kojokalo, um, do you feel, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of extract the, the overall conclusion of what we're discussing when it comes to non-NATO and non-EU members, um, do you feel that there is a sea change in the way Europe, and, and I emphasize Europe, not, not, not the US, not the UK, because I think they were probably there already. But is Europe thinking of this region and of continental security differently? Um, and, and is it serious about the EU accession perspective for uh, Ukraine or, and Moldova? Because we are in the Balkans, and I think there's so much experience here of disillusionment with EU promises. Is this likely to happen to Ukraine and Moldova as well? Or this time it's different? Yes, this time is different, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm very glad that you used the, the word sea change. I'm using all the time in relation with the Black Sea, you know, it's the same family. Uh, and we are also uh, using the watershed uh, moment uh, in, in European uh, security. Yes, this time around is different. We have seen an unprecedented mobilization at the European level in relation with granting the status of candidate countries for Republic of Moldova and Ukraine. I remember back in June the visit of the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, in Kiev and also the visit of Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz of Germany and also uh, Italy, France and Romanians leaders in Kiev and after this important uh, visits in Kiev, uh, we had that gigantic step forward. And right now, I think this is very much linked with the strategic future of the European Union at the end of the day. And I think we need workable policies and the united front towards achieving concrete steps uh, on the path to, to, to enlargement uh, for these countries. Black Sea is for sure not a sea of love and peace, like some defined this back in 2016 when we talked about the Black Sea flotilla. Yes, Romania was amongst the countries who very strongly, very vocally advocated the need to do more for the Black Sea because at that time the Black Sea was getting warmer, hot, 
and now indeed is at the boiling point. We need to do more for our partners. It's important to increase their resilience, their, their defense capabilities. Look how important reversal of the foreign policy options in Europe took place. Germany increased the defense budget. Denmark. Uh, but this is, this is crisis management. This is a reaction to crisis. Is this likely to turn into structural change for the medium and long term? Yes, this is the high time to do this. Thank you very much. I will ask you the same question, uh, Mr. Flenkia. Do you feel that this time it's different? Is there optimism in Moldova that you not just have an EU perspective, but you are moving in that direction? And given how long the process might take, um, is Moldova counting only on this process for diversification of energy, for more support and security cooperation, or um, do you feel that cooperation on a bilateral level with partners like Romania, like Poland, like others, like Ukraine, uh, might actually be the more immediate answer? No, I don't, um, I don't think the two contradict each other. Uh, but also, is it different? Yes, everything is different uh, this time, obviously. I mean, 2022 is different in so many years, in every single respect. Uh, but also, for Moldovan and Moldovans, I think, and I couldn't underscore more how important it is uh, the support this, this, uh, this upcoming winter. Because any future uh, uh, prospects, any future discussion, they all depend on whether or not Moldova is a uh, sovereign, independent nation and its people survive this winter uh, energy and financially. I mean, we're, uh, again, I have to get back to, to poverty and weaponization of, 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 of energy resources. But pretty soon, in about a month, Moldovans will start receiving bills, energy bills that will get to the point of average household uh, revenues monthly, or even go above it. So obviously the, the, the government will, will do their best to compensate, but we're not talking about the level of compensation they apply in, in uh, Romania or in Germany or in the Baltic states. So uh, right now, this winter, Moldova is going to be a very fragile construct and country that needs support because otherwise we're risking of, of collapsing uh, the, the infrastructure and political institutions. In so we, 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 get, we survive the winter, and then I think the track will be positive. Mm -hmm. In two minutes, um, I'll move to questions from the room. Uh, but Mr. Costa, very briefly, are we forgetting one important player here, and that is China? Um, <laughs> isn't it likely that China will be interested in participating in Ukraine's reconstruction? Isn't it likely that China is just silently enjoying uh, what Russia is doing and then waiting to reap the benefits, including in this region? Yes. Thank you very much. We're <laughs> moving to the next speaker. <laughs> uh, we are, I think we are somehow um, neglecting China, although it is very difficult to neglect uh, 1.4 billion people and a, a, a whatever China means. Uh, Yes, I'm certain that China eyes very hopefully the chance of reconstruction, reconstructing Ukraine. Remind, let us remind uh, the, the strategic partnership between China and Ukraine that was signed um, almost 10 years uh, uh, ago. Um, there are a lot of interests. Time is not a no other place to list the shared interest between Ukraine and China, no matter who is running Ukraine, uh, I don't think there are many questions on who is running China. Um, last but not least, the strategic interests, whether China is happy what's going on in order to come back later as the savior of the game, I think they, perhaps uh, the, the, the uh, Chinese interests looked that way. Now they are not very sure, mm -hmm. because it may be the situation, the end situation, is much worse than they had hoped. What mm -hmm. I think we can be very sure about is that they don't like it. It is not something that China 
would have needed right now. Another conflict in an area of great interest. And don't forget that the Western us, we uh, need China as bad as they need us. Sure. Can, can I ask you for a very quick answer to one essential question that ties into the title of this uh, security conference? And that is, uh, to go back to what Vesela was saying, is it likely that in this region we're going to trade democracy for security, at least for the, for the short term? I cannot imagine that sort of deal to be acceptable uh, to, in any case, uh, the, the vast majority of European countries. The, the question that I, I rather ask myself is, and it's linked obviously to my work uh, with the OSCE, I mean the whole raison d'etre of the development of the OSCE was to develop a security structure, as one always says, from Vancouver to Vladivostok, that allows for some kind of engagement uh, with the Russian Federation. And, and obviously um, uh, this, 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 this dialogue was maintained under periods when Russia was very, or the Soviet Union, its predecessor, was very far from being a democracy, and we don't know, I mean, I listened to the fascinating discussion we had earlier on, on the future of Russia, in which direction it is going now. But I think that, nonetheless, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is what needs to happen, what needs to happen in Ukraine, what needs to happen in Europe, so that we can have some sort of meaningful interaction uh, with the Russians after, this, after the dust, as everybody has settled in this process as well. And I guess perhaps the first question to ask is what needs to happen in Russia so that we can engage with it. Yes, but I mean, as I said, as I said uh, the question is not an absolute question because, I mean, uh, uh, the, the OEC and the CAC uh, the, the CSE which preceded it started out under circumstances when the place was not a democracy either. Uh, so, and, and I mean the chances of Russia turning into a democracy of the type that, uh, that we have experienced, uh, should I say, uh, I mean this is a sort of, this is a very complex perspective, I mean to put mm -hmm. it very carefully. But what I'm saying is right now, I mean, it is clear that even the OEC cannot serve that purpose that it was created for historically, but if we look at security perspectives in Europe, uh, in Europe in the medium and long term, this is an important question that we need to answer. Thank you, and I'm sure there are other um, questions in the room, or at least I, I expect that we have uh, started many fronts of uh, discussion that, that might be continued. So if there are any, uh, if anyone wants to, to ask a question or to make a comment, um, please definitely do so. I don't know if the host can ask questions. I but think you we can make an exception. Can you make an exception? Thank you. Um, what happens to Moldova if Maya Sandu can't keep her position and her government can't keep her position? Um, we've seen some protests. Of course, they've been kind of motivated by certain players in the country that have sympathies towards Moscow. But, but how do you see that in Moldova's position um, amid the war in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. I guess it's me. <laughs> First answer the question. I, uh, I think, again, building on, on what I said about poverty that helps Russia so much push its agenda and mobilize people who are otherwise not pro-Russian, but mobilize them under the flags of the uh, allegedly uh, um, pro-Russian parties. Uh, I think Moldova's greatest um, challenge long term is, will, is and will be uh, ensuring a genuine pluralism in Moldova. I think that Moldova's future and securing Moldova's European future is, at this point, about making sure that people who think and people who feel pro-European have a genuine choice, have a pluralistic choice, and uh, uh, by that, by ensuring that choice, you also eliminate the completely artificial pro-EU versus pro-Russia choice. Again, art completely artificial in Moldova because it's being fueled by, by forces who want to, to split Moldova and uh, always make any election, any parliamentary election in Moldova an existential question, East or West. I think it's a completely false narrative that's being utilized by those who, who wish to keep Moldova in this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Or else, um, I'm um, the, the one thing that I, I would like to um, to ask all of you because I think um, it, it it might be a, a pretty complicated question um, is. We are talking about regional um, security cooperation, whether in NATO, whether in the EU or uh, in any other format. But we have clear differences in this region, inside NATO and EU borders and outside NATO and EU borders. Um, I mean, we have Hungary um, that has a completely different position than the, the rest of the EU. We have um, our host country, Serbia, that positions itself completely differently from EU countries, although um, it is aspiring to be an EU member, at least declaratively. Um, is there any way that we can break this deadlock? What, what, are, the, what are the perspectives of actually forging a, a security consensus here? Or perhaps it just cannot be done. Maybe the trade-offs are just um, too much. Mm -hmm. May I just bring one more element to this conversation, uh, and I know we will have a discussion on enlargement uh, later on, but um, I think we should really look at the European political community as um, maybe an avenue of, at least if not as an, as an institution, because it's not going to be an institution with, uh, you know, secretariats and so on, but it's a, I think it's a, it's a new political forum where the questions of the European security architecture can be tackled uh, without Russia sitting at the table, because this is bas the basic um, characteristic of, uh, of the EPC. Um, and the EPC being the avenue also for those countries who aspire um, to become uh, EU members to have substantial conversations about EU security while they're still outside uh, of the Union. And I think this, um, this is something we should be watching. The next meeting of the EPC is going to take place in Moldova. Uh, and I think this is a great uh, sign also and a recognition for the strategic importance of Moldova succeeding. Um, uh, but, but also it's going to include the UK. Um, we haven't mentioned UK, but the UK has been a very significant player in the Black Sea, uh, also in, uh, in, in military terms. And um, uh, it can obviously include, uh, it, it does include Central Asia and Turkey and so on. So all of a sudden the European continent has... Uh, uh, maybe a, just a new place to, to discuss its, uh, its security architecture, and I think we should, even if some of us are skeptical, we should still uh, watch it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will try to, uh, to say that be it uh, consensus or unanimity, NATO or EU, we achieved important decisions uh, this year, at least in the eight months since 24 of February. So. We are talking indeed about unity. Uh, you mentioned a couple of allies or member states uh, on, and also partners uh, in trying to get you know, the consensus in relation with the security at the regional European level. So I think we are on a good path. Moreover, I would like to, to say in this framework that there are a couple of regional formats that we need to Revive. One is the Southeastern Defense Ministerial. Currently, Bulgaria is holding the presidency. Romania is going to hold this presidency for two years, starting with mid-summer 2023. Uh, also, we will agree in this region that Western Balkans are still a very fragile region, and we need to assume more, more responsibility and commitment, and look uh, in, this, uh, in this way to Bosnia-Herzegovina, to Euphor Altia, look to, to NATO K4, and look to all this network of missions, operations, regional formats, and I think there is place to do more together in, uh, in, uh, in towards reaching a common understanding, at least, of the risk threats to, to our security, regionally speaking. Thank you very much. Um, we're already past the, <laughs> past the end of our panel, so just please make it really short. Right, two, two, two sentences. 
um, by the way of uh, reviving certain um, organizational uh, or regional organizations or structures, we seem to forget that there is one which is called Black Sea Economic Cooperation, the BSEC, which was, surprise, surprise, initiated by Turkey, and which is, well, is there. It has everything that an uh, organization needs. It has a bank, it has parliamentary assembly, it has a summit uh, that makes decisions, everything, and it is over-institutionalized and totally in ineffective. But it is there. Mm -hmm. And an addition, we just need to, to, to keep that in mind. Of course, uh, it is by sheer coincidence I, I, I raise this issue right now, then uh, that uh, we, the, sec the director general of the organization is a former Romanian foreign minister. Uh, no connection. Now, the second point Quick. is uh, Russia will go nowhere, whether it will change or not. Neither will Turkey go anywhere. They will stay both. So we need also to think what we want our relationship be with them in the future. Thank you. Well, first of all, I think uh, the first step towards a security cooperation is a shared risk assessment. And I think in this yeah. context, we have made relatively big steps forward. And I mean, I'm not speaking of Sweden and Finland. I mean, even in more uh, uh, sort of a traditional neutral countries like my own home country, which is tripling its defense expenditure. And Switzerland, you have a completely new discussion about European risks. I also think to come back to this earlier point you made, that the decision that was taken with regard to the candidate status of Ukraine and Moldova was quite exceptional. I spent four years in the European Union, managed a dissent uh, uh, where member states were not agreed, able to agree that these countries have a perspective that they can share on. And then within three months, uh, you got to a process that took three years and hasn't got that far in the case of the Western Balkans. And I think that obviously the logic is that this, uh, this, this logic has to be taken forward also in the Western Balkans. Right now, what has happened is that, that the situation has strengthened NATO. But we do not know in the longer term where the Americans will be on this. And clearly, it opens up questions for the future of Europe. European security, which will need to be answered, and I think we've done the first step, and the next steps will need to be taken. Thank you. Uh, many thanks to the speakers. I think uh, we have all earned our lunch, and many thanks <laughs> to you for, for having that patience. Um, I think this is uh, the time to say uh, bon appétit. <laughs> right.